Oh, hey everybody, my name is Jack. Uh, I'm the Frontline Advisor. I mentioned you earlier in the, uh, the session. So we, you should be here if you are an admission, if you have admission to humanities or social science. So you're in the correct room. Anybody in the wrong room? Okay, uh, so we're gonna get right into this because we have a fairly long presentation. Uh, there, your admission stream is fun and interesting for all kinds of reasons. I uh, want to think about you guys is that you're a little less um, prescriptive, a little bit less structured than some of the other admission streams. Uh, and so this is going to be a pretty general conversation about what to expect in your course moments, some strategies for choosing your courses. And I want to have some time for uh, questions and discussion. So if anybody has a question at any point, just raise your hand uh, and I'll answer it, or I will tell you what we're going to be doing with it in a little bit after. Okay, let's get right into it. So, um, Denise went over this a little bit with you already, uh, but I just want to get a couple of important dates out of the way for you right here. So July 4th, you want to make sure that you're logging into ACORN. You should have already been able to do this. You can do that with your going ID. You specifically want to be looking what your course enrollment time is. So this is going to tell you the exact minutes that you can enroll into ACORN. This is the day, the time on the 21st of July that you're going to be logging into ACORN to do your course enrollment. So the really important date is the 21st. But you want to know when on the 21st of August by looking July 4th. The 29th of July is when priority, so a key indicator on courses in the timetable builder, are going to drop. We're going to go into enrollment indicators in a little bit, um, but just keep in mind that's when the general enrollment period begins. The 31st of August is when your either your first payment or your deferral of your fees is going to be due. You got to make sure that you do that. We'll be going into that in a little, a little bit more detail later. And lastly, courses begin on the 8th of September. There's a bunch of other dates that you want to know. Uh, there's a link here that you obviously can't click right now because it's on the screen, but we're going to be making the, time, the, uh, the slides available later for you to review this stuff. Okay, so first section is basics. Denise covered a lot of this stuff, um, so I'm going to sort of blaze through this because I want to spend more time on strategy. But if anything comes up that you don't expect, raise your hands, ask questions, whatever, that's fine. So session, term, FS, what are all these things? To be clear, you are joining the 2022-2023 fall winter session. The fall winter session is comprised of two terms, the fall term and the winter term, fall term being F, S term being S. You'll see this is a, this is grabbed right from the timetable builder, which is a resource we're going to be going into a little bit during the session. You want to make sure that you're looking for courses in all three of those areas because that's those are each courses are hosted in F and S terms, and Y courses, which run the whole period, are obviously going to run for both the F and the S terms. You are going to be choosing courses for the entire year of the 21st, so not just the fall. They'll be choosing your winter courses as well. Okay, uh, this. Denise went over pretty extensively. I'm going to touch on it very quickly. Obviously, H means half. So that's the half credit that you're going to, that one or 0 0.5 to the 20 that you need to earn. The Y course, the 1.0. So it'll earn you one of the 20. Y courses are the ones that are going to be running all the way through. H courses will either say H1F for fall or H1S for winter. You'll very occasionally see codes that are Y1F or H1Y. As humanities, social science students, you're probably not going to see these. Don't worry about them too much. Ask me later in the email if you want a course that looks like that. Okay, so for your course loads, standard full-time course loads for an arts and science student is five courses a term for 5.0 FCEs total for a year. As Denise mentioned, you're looking to get 20 credits. That completes things in four years, nice and clean, super easy. You can absolutely take less courses than these. There's nothing stopping you from taking less courses than this. You can take as many courses as you want, less than that. However, you can only take a maximum of six courses total, and you can only actually add that sixth course after the 29th when the general enrollment period begins. We don't recommend you take six courses in your first year. The sort of Typical thing, what we expect, what students generally do as full time students is the five. Six is a lot of work. Uh, we maybe after your first year, when you're confident in yourself and you know what to expect from university courses, you can do that. But we do suggest no more than five. 
as Denise and Donald already mentioned, try to balance your load. So if you're taking four courses in the fall, four courses in the winter is good. Maybe four in one, five in the other, three and six, not that you good. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of a, a review of what the calendar looks like, but I just wanna cover this quickly. So when you're looking at a course, there's a couple of different things you wanna make sure that you check and you know. You wanna know that it has prerequisites and you meet those prerequisites. You wanna know if it has co-requisites and I should explain. So the prereqs, probably relatively self-explanatory, you need to have those things in order to be able to take the course. Let's say for example, you wanted to take a, a math course, you wanted to branch out and try out math, it's probably going to have a grade 12 math expectation. So you wanna make sure you have it. For Corex, it's expected that you take that course at the same time you are taking the course you want to take. So let's say for example, I, I, can't, I don't have one immediately on hand, but let's say you're taking physics 101 and you wanted to take math 101. Or if, if you took physics 101, if, that, if it had the co-requisite of math 101, you had to take them both at the same time. You can't take them separately, they're from sessions, they have to be taken together. If you have one, if, if you already have taken the course co-requisite, you can treat it as a prerequisite. So you can you don't have to worry about taking it at the same time as long as you've earned the other courses expected. Lastly, exclusions. You can't take a course if you already have an exclusion. So if you, you actually technically can take the course, but you won't get credit for it. If you find yourself in a situation where you need to take an exclusion course, that's a good time to come talk to our office. You're going to want to check enrollment indicators. I've got a slide on that in just a sec. You want to read course descriptions. Um, sometimes it's not entirely clear what the differences between two courses would be. The, the, course, sorry, the course descriptions will clarify that for you. It might say something to the effect of one of these courses is meant more for students going into, let's say, economic specialists. It might say one of them is more intended for commerce specialists. It'll clarify for you if it's not a you want to make sure that you're checking the schedule for the course, including if it has lecture sections, tutorial sections, and practical session sections. Um, courses don't necessarily have tutorial or practicals, but they will always have lectures. You want to make sure that you know all of the things that you have to schedule. And lastly, you want to make sure you know where the course is, how it's being delivered, what the room number is, all that kind of information. So, so as an example here, I pulled SIN 105, which is an entry-level cinema studies course. I just want to go over some of the things that we've talked about. So we know, for example, we check the prerequisites. There's none. We check the co-requisites. There's none. We see that these are the exclusions for the course. So if we have, if we've taken any of these courses in the past, we know that we can't get credit for this course. We're going to check the description to make sure that there's nothing here specific that we need to know. It's an intro cinema studies course, so it's pretty straightforward. You want to look at the timetable instructions. You want to get a sense that this, if this one specifies it has one lecture, it has a practicum, it has a tutorial, you need to enroll in all of these things. It does have an enrollment control, and you want to know what that is, so you're going to search that up. It has some information about the location, but at this point, a lot of the stuff, and this is still the case on Timetable Builder, it's going to be TBD, TBA, they're still scheduling a lot of stuff. But at least you know what the lecture time is, so you can start to schedule it. You can plot that out in your time table. This information you can find under the, uh, the more course information. So make sure whenever you're looking at descriptions in the time table builder that you look at both of these things. Now I mentioned enrollment indicators before. This is what the enrollment indicators are. And that's what you're going to see when you go to the legend in time table builder. You want to know what enrollment controls are because you want to make sure that you have them. The big ones that you're going to be seeing in your first year are priority P, E, which is enrolled department, and then R1, which is restriction. In the case of priority, if you don't have a priority for a course, you can't add it until that general enrollment period begins, which is the 29th of July. If it's E, it means that you have to enroll the department. There's going to be some sort of special process the department has for you that you were meant to follow in order to add the course. You might see this, for example, in some language courses, particularly because you might have some background in the language you want to study. The department will expect you to contact them and do, say, a test, and then they'll enroll you in the course. So make sure you know that that's there. For R1, that's a restriction. If you don't have that restriction, you can't add the course. Simple as that. Specifically for uh, the first year foundation seminars for in a students, you'll see a rare R2, 
which basically just means that for until the general enrollment period begins, the course is restricted just to you. After that, the restriction extends to all first year students. So you get a special week of enrollment courses. Okay, so there's roughly two kinds of courses. Um, that this is a bit of a generalization, but it's a good it's good to help you sort of think about courses. There's really big courses and there's really small courses. So for the big courses, these can be a, you may be familiar in high school with some of these. Um, so your your high school classes probably were generally in the smaller category. When we talk about big courses, we're saying a few hundred to all the way up to fifteen hundred students, which is those courses in Convocation Hall. Some of the courses uh, that are that size, you can see here, you might be taking some of them as a social science uh, admin. These really big courses are going to be pretty unique. They're really large. You're going to be like an audience in, in a really large concert environment. Um, it's typically the case with these courses because there's going to be a lot of you sitting and you listening to a departmental, or a, sorry, to a professor instructing. I think of them they're really welcoming really charismatic instructors that are good at controlling the audience, good at keeping you engaged, it can be really, really enjoyable. And you're still going to get a, opportunities to work with small groups in your tutorial sections, assuming the course has them, or your practical sessions, assuming that the course has them. The smaller courses are going to be more familiar to you coming from, uh, from high school. Approximately 47% of first year courses have an alumni. 30 students or less. A lot of those seminar courses, that's where some of these 30 or fewer are coming from. There's going to be a much larger expectation. You're going to be sitting at a, a sort of big table with a bunch of other students. The instructor is going to want to talk to you, engage with you. You're going to have a really hard time hiding that you didn't read the book. Um, it's really going to be great for you to meet peers, start talking in an academic voice, start finding topics that you're interested in speaking about and defending in the classroom. So they can be really, really interesting as well. Okay, so some general tips for making good decisions during your course at home. First and foremost, there's a lot of information out there. You should go get it. For the courses you want to take, you want to look at the arts and science websites. You want to look at the departmental websites. You want to get a good sense of what everybody, what, what information is out there officially about the course. You want to look at what the, stu the student community is saying, including all kinds of social media stuff like Reddit and those kinds of things. But I do recommend any social media stuff, treat it with a grain of salt. You always want to trust the experts here at the registrar's office, but it's still useful. On Quarkus, you've probably seen that there's an area called course evaluations. You hopefully can access that already. If you can't, you will be able to access it once you upgrade your, your, uh, your joint ID to a UTOR ID. And this will give you a bunch of statistical information about how students feel about courses. Lastly, of course, you can come talk to us. Remember, you can make changes in the first couple of weeks of classes. You can drop the classes you're in and add new ones. So if you're not completely sure you want to take a course, that's OK. You can make changes as you go. Class averages are usually between C plus to B. It doesn't really vary that much outside of that range. And you, as an individual, you know, an average is an average. You can be the person pulling it up. The important thing about this is that don't be intimidated by a course that says C+. If you want that course, you're here to study, you're here to become a university student, you're here to engage your own mind, you should be taking the courses that you want to take, not just the ones that you think are going to give you a good average. Don't be intimidated by high course numbers, so that's second and third digit. It doesn't mean that the course is harder. A lot of the first year seminar courses are going to be in the 190s. It doesn't mean that they're the hardest first year courses. Um, just so make sure, again, you're reading the course description, you're getting a sense of what to expect. For the 200, 300, and 400 level, as Denise mentioned, they do roughly correspond to the year of study, but a lot of the 200 level courses are designed as intro courses. They're meant for first year students, so do feel free to take those. You might want to reconsider taking any others because courses beyond that will expect that you have some experience as a university student. The pace might be a little bit too fast for you. Okay, so for your year of study, I, this was touched on briefly, you're probably first year students. You are considered a first year student as long as you have less than 4.0 FCEs earned at the university. So if you have no transfer credits, you obviously are a first year student. Uh, if you do have transfer credits, including from advanced placements, international baccalaureate, whatever the case is, we can have a conversation about what that means for you if you're not sure. 
Uh, in preparation for advancing to second year, which is the term after you've earned those four credits, you need to make sure that you are ready to enroll in programs because ACORN will require you to have programs to add your courses. So as you're earning those four credits, you wanna make sure that you're enrolling in the courses you need to meet the admission requirements for the programs you want. Just as a, an FYI, you reach third year at nine credits, you reach fourth year at 14 credits. Okay, so that's the basics. I wanna get into a little bit of stuff about strategy and planning and how you're gonna approach this. So starting from the very beginning, the first thing that I wanna make sure that I cover is that again, humanity and social sciences advocates, there's all kinds of different people in this room that have all kinds of different ideas about what they wanna study. Uh, there, it's, the, it's the least prescriptive set of programs. There's a lot of programs out there that are open enrollments. There's a lot of programs that have uh, that are cross-disciplinary, which means that they draw from all kinds of different departments. So I don't want to spend too much time looking at one specific area because somebody might in this room might want to do economics. Somebody might want to do sexual diversity studies. It's that the range is very, very wide in terms of what you want to do. Um, so as Denise mentioned, the calendar is the first place to start. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting that I'm attached to this time. Um, so the calendar is going to list all of the departments and all of the program areas that are within the Faculty of Arts and Science. There's probably things in there that you don't even realize you can study. Start there, look at departments that look interesting, look at programs that look interesting, and just get a sense of the programs that you want to study. Remember, you can take up to three, uh, so you have a lot of variety that you can put into your degree. With those courses that you need to take in order to meet the admission requirements for those programs, you're probably going to end up with somewhere between two to four FCEs of enrollment. Whatever is left of that, if you want to enroll in more courses, you can start tackling the breadth requirements that we were talking about. You can start thinking about trying the language, and you can certainly think about a first year foundation course. So I just have a couple of examples of, of the programs here just to give you an idea of what to expect with that enrollment range. Economics, which I'm sure some of you are interested in, is one of the more structured cases. So you're going to see here that it requires these eco courses and these math courses. Just to, just to see and make sure the room is, knows how the calendar works. That slash up there between the eco courses, does anybody know what that means? So you can, there's eco 101, eco 102, and eco 105. Anybody have any thoughts on what that slash indicates? You could take uh, Eco 101, 102, or Eco 105. Exactly, yes. So the slash delineates groups of courses. So correct. You can take either Eco 101 and Eco 102 or Eco 105. You might want to know what the difference is between Eco 102 and Eco, Eco 101, 102, and Eco 105. Read the calendar. It'll tell you what the differences are. Same thing with math. Lots of similar course codes. You want to read the calendar and get a sense of what the expectation is. But as you can see, you're going to need at least two FCEs of courses in order to meet those requirements for the economics major. You'll also see that it lists right there at the top that you need four credits total in order to enroll. That's your advancement to the second year. Another useful example here is urban studies. This is one of those cross-disciplinary programs. So maybe you are interested in one of these groups like sociology or, or geography. Maybe you're interested in political science. It, a program like urban studies makes it pretty easy to take a major in one of that, that area and then also work towards an urban studies program. Something that's really worth mentioning about the urban studies major is that it mentions this variable minimum grade average thing that you're going to see on some programs. This indicates that it's a competitive program that has a limited number of spaces. And so you need to get the highest grades you can in those courses in order to be considered for the program. There's a risk that you're not going to be able to enroll, which means that you're going to want to make sure you have some backup ideas for programs you want to take. In a case like economics, where it doesn't say it's variable, as long as you meet those minimums, you're going to be able to enroll. The last example is the open enrollment programs. So these are programs that you can just add. There's not going to be anything that stops you aside from needing those four credits. These structure or these programs, the structure tends to be a lot more open. It tends to make a lot of uh, it, it advises you how to approach the courses, but it won't have a really clear structure on how to do it. So as you can see with these days of studies, they think you should take EAS 103 and 105 in your first year. You don't have to. They think if you want to take language, it's a good time to start in your first year, but you don't have to. That's kind of up to you 
how you want to approach it. Okay, any questions so far? Just, just making sure that we're good. Okay, so first year foundation programs, Charlie brought this up, Denise brought these up. These courses are awesome for a lot of reasons. Um, there's a couple of different areas to cover. Um, so I, I don't wanna spend tons of time on this, but we'll, we'll go over them. So the first thing that I wanna mention is that there's lots of seminars they cover, uh, they often cover breadth requirements that you might have difficulty completing otherwise. And they have courses that are, say, in the sciences or in physical math or these kinds of areas that are meant for humanities and social science students. So you might want to give them a look. There are 13 in this college FYF seminars that are specifically for you. Only you get priority enrollment in them on the 29th. You should give a look to that uh, the page. If you just go in this college FYF seminars, you'll find it. Uh, and again, we'll make this link available to everybody. The ones programs are structured specific uh, groups of programs. They're similar to the seminars in that they're a smaller size, but they put a lot of em or emphasis on two things. There's going to be a lot of sort of experiential learning elements. So there's going to be some, uh, some field trips. You might leave the kid or the course or the, the classroom a fair bit. And they'll have guest lecturers. So people that are in the field that that instructor is really interested in studying. You might want to look at the ones to see what the themes are that they're arranged around, because it, there might be an area that you're really interested in studying. And all of these things put together are meant to stimulate your intellectual curiosity. You might be a social science or humanities student who doesn't really know what you want to study yet. A big part of these courses is to help you figure that out and make sense of the stuff that you're interested in reading about and studying about and having your hands on. Okay, so you've done the calendar bit. You've got a sense of the courses you want to take. Now what are you going to do? It's time to start plotting out your stuff on Timetable Builder. We're going to do a demonstration in a bit. It's very straightforward. It's very easy to do. You shouldn't focus on giving yourself days off just to have days off. It's nice that you get to sleep in, but your goal is to be a successful student and to get and to do the courses you want to do, not just sleep in on respite. With that being said, you should focus on choosing times that work for a couple of different areas. Your brain, obviously. So if you're a morning person, take morning courses. If you are not a morning person, take evening courses. If you need days off because you need to work or you need them just to collect yourself or whatever the case is, take the days off. If you've got family obligations, if you've got friend obligations, if you've got these kinds of things, you're now a university student building your own schedule, you can take the days off that you need. We've already covered that you should make sure that you're getting all the sections. We've looked at an example of how SIM 105 tells you that you need to enroll in one of each. Um, so we don't need to dwell on that too much. A big thing is that ACORN, so the system that you use to enroll in courses, it won't stop you from enrolling in courses that have conflicts. Timetable Builder will tell you there's a conflict. It'll be big and red and it will insist that you have a conflict, but ACORN won't stop you from enrolling. You don't want to be in conflicting courses. It will screw up the two courses. Do not do that. If there are two courses that you want that are in conflict, take one of them. Uh, if you really desperately need to take both of these courses, come and talk to us, we'll help you build a plan. Lastly, plan some backups. There's a possibility you're not gonna get all the courses you want. We'll get on that in a bit. You also wanna choose back-to-back -back courses pretty carefully because campus is big. I don't know if you spent a lot of time here yet, but it's a very, very large campus. When I was a student here a long, long time ago, uh, I lived at New, which is in this corner here, and I had a class all the way up to that, the top corner, which is at Victoria College, in the winter. And I could run, run really fast, and I could make it in the 10 minutes that you get. But the class that I had at New, I was close to the door, and the class that was at Vic, it was easy to get into the classroom. If the class that you're in on one side, you're in the back of a really big theater, and it's really hard to get around, and the winter is really, really bad, 10 minutes is going to be pretty tough. So give some thought to if you're having back-to-back -back courses, where they're actually located on campus. And obviously, if it's going to fry your brain, don't do it. OK, so we're going to look at the timetable builder. Let's hope that this all works smoothly. OK, so this is the timetable builder. This is the, the, the utility that Donald mentioned is pretty new. Uh, so some of the functionality isn't completely perfect yet, but most of it is pretty awesome and pretty easy to use. The first thing that you're going to be doing when you look at Timetable Builder is that you want to make sure that you're highlighting the faculty that you're a part of. Do you know the faculty that you're a part of? Which faculty is it? Thank you. 
Okay. You do want to make sure, unless you're looking, you've gotten to the, the technical part where you're being a little bit more specific about which term you want. Make sure that you have all the sessions highlighted. If you get rid of all of these, timetable builder will say there's no courses that have no sections. Uh, you won't find anything. You don't want to remove the why unless you don't want why courses, so on and so on. Does anybody have a course that they were interested in looking at? Anybody done any research beforehand? They're like, oh, I really want to study Korean. Sure. I think Japanese is one to go to. So, yeah. Okay. So we were able to find EIS 120, Modern Standard Japanese, because it's a Y course and we're looking for Y courses. So you're going to punch in your course. As you can see, it helps you along with finding the courses. The search function is still a little finicky, so be as specific as you can with your searches. And you're going to look up your course. This is going to pull open the entry. And there's two important areas to timetable builder. The first is obviously the results, and the second is the timetable, which we're going to get into in just a second. So, as we were talking about with Sin 105, you want to make sure that you're looking over the course description and timetable builder pretty closely. Read the timetable instructions because for Japanese, for example, and other languages courses, there's some specifics about say, if you have previous experience, you need to show that you have, uh, like maybe you studied it on your own a little bit in high school and you need to see if you qualify for the 200 level course. This is, you, you'll have to follow the instructions that they have here. You wanna make sure that you look at the more course information. You wanna make sure that you find out, for example, that these courses are not eligible for credit, not credit. Did Denise cover credit, no credit? No, barely. Okay, we'll cover credit, no credit in just a moment. You wanna make sure that there's no prerequisites. You wanna make sure that there's no prerequisites. This, the rest of this we covered already, we talked about, so it should be pretty straightforward. So when you want to actually book this course, you've got your timetable here right now, there's nothing in it because we haven't actually chosen any courses. There is a course plan function, but it's not, perfect, partially because it doesn't do a good job of reflecting courses that don't have an actual time and location. So if they're asynchronous, um, it, it doesn't really know what to do with those courses. I would recommend, particularly as first year students doing this for the first time, that you individually book each section that you want. And so you're very clear on what you're doing. So we want to look at the lecture sections. We want to get a sense of which one works for us. Looks like lecture 0202 is going to work and we add it to our timetable and boom it's right there so you're going to add the sections for the courses you want you know that this course also requires tutorials it looks like it's not letting you book the tutorials yet because if we're still early in the course enrollment period some of the stuff isn't uh, isn't completely finalized and it also this one might have specific yeah so this is a good example of one of the courses where one of the lecture sections has specific tutorial sections that it wants you to enroll so I misspoke, it actually does have a very specific tutorial it wants you to add. Add the sections of the courses you want. Once you've done this, you can go look for another course where we've added EAS 120. So let's imagine we're looking at an East Asian Studies program. So we know that we also need EAS 103. So our Japanese course is still here. Now we look for a section in EAS 103 that's going to work for us. And we'll add it to the time. Oh, looks like I accidentally just wiped out. Huh. Look at that. Why did I just leave my EAS one twenty? I'm confused why that is happening. Oh, I'm sorry. It's because I didn't hit search. Look at me. Okay, so now, sorry guys. Uh, now you add the sections for the other course that you want. This is a winter course by the looks of Earth, but not course. As you can see, I'm not as expert in this as I should be yet. It's a brand new tool. Um, but it should, in theory, be adding a course. Oh, it's because the location is CBA, maybe? Online asynchronous. Thank you. You are saving my life here. Uh, so, synchronous courses, asynchronous courses, once again, they don't reflect in time table there quite perfectly. So, this is one of the problems with the system. You get the idea. Oh, yeah. So, it's showing you. 
on my answer from there. So there you go. Anyway, I'm sorry for that bit of a fumble with the, uh, with the demonstration, but you get the idea of the timetable builder. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty intuitive. Please use it um, as part of your course planning. Okay. So you use the timetable builder to build the schedule. You now have your courses. You now have a good idea of where they're going to be. It's time to nail that plan down. Timetable Builder is a building is a is a uh, planning tool. Another tool that you have in Acorn is something called the enrollment cart. You can put the courses that you intend to take in the enrollment cart, and this preloads them into a nice clean list for when the time comes on your course enrollment date to go and enroll in your courses. I want to be very very clear. Using enrollment cart does not enroll you in the courses. It just makes it very easy to enroll in courses. You still need to log in on the 21st of July and click enroll on your courses. You're going to make sure that you check your enrollment time on the 4th of July so you know exactly the, the time that you're supposed to log in to enroll in your courses. Yeah, what's up? Sorry, um, when you say time, is that like kind of a time that you're to? It, it does, yeah. So we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, so you want to log in at the time that you're going to be enrolling in courses and click enroll in all those courses. You also, so in preparation for the 21st, you've done your courses, you've, you've put your courses in your enrollment carts, you've got a good sense of the programs you want, you're going to double check, you're going to make sure you're happy with what you've done, you're going to adjust if you want to adjust, and then you're going to actually vote. And now finally, it's the 21st big day. You're going to log in the very minute that you can. You're not going to panic about lag on Acorn. It tends to lag on enrollment day. Don't worry about that too much. You should not panic refresh because if you do that, it will actually slow down your request to use Acorn and will probably make your enrollment a little bit slower. Just make sure that you log in, you wait, you get to your enrollment page and you enroll in your courses. You want to enroll in your courses in the order of how badly you want them. The courses that you need for your programs, those are the ones you should be choosing first. There's a possibility if you do not enroll fast enough, that you're going to end up on some wait lists. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. Remember, if you're trying to add any of courses with those e-enrollment indicators, that means that the department is involved in enrolling you in that course. Make sure that you leave a spot in uh, the remaining capacity in your enrollment for this course. Yes, what's up? Yeah, so uh, the, the question is, do if you're using enrollment cards, do you have to do the whole enrollment process again, or do, can you just click? The whole value of enrollment card is you can just click. So it'll have a list built out for you. You can, if you go to that Acorn How To site that's linked, and again, you'll get access to these slides afterwards. You could just you just click down the list for the enrolls. Yeah, so you won't be able to enroll in the course if you don't have the priority. But you should definitely make sure when you're adding. Oh, I see what you mean. I think it just lists them. Um, I'm not sure how late, if it's chronological, if it's alphabetical. So just make sure that you, you're prepared for clicking because it, they'll, they're all on one page. So it's just a matter of scrolling down to find the course. Do you know what time of day the enrollment opens? So you, you will find out on the 4th. It varies both based on the humanities, social science, and then it can also range by a couple of hours. I'm just going to say the exact same thing that um, some one admission category is going to be for another. Yes. So if you are starting at 10 in the morning and you have a friend who starts at 6, and you think, oh my God, I'm four hours after my friend, that person is probably in a different admission yes. category. And to Jack's point about panicking, don't. Yes. And the, the, within your category, there's also some variance. So that's ranges by a couple of hours. Um, Okay, also, does everybody remember what your limit for course enrollment is before the general enrollment period? Five. Five, yeah, five per term. So if you have an E course, you want to only enroll in four courses for that term to leave space. Okay, so wait lists. You might end up on a wait list. When you are enrolling in courses off of ACORN, it will prompt you and let you know that you're joining a wait list. When you join a wait list, you join it in queue, so you get a rank. If a student drops that course, you move up a rank. If you're the first person on the wait list and somebody drops, Acorn emails you and says, hooray, congrats, you got in, and you're put in the course. If you're on a wait list, that course, despite the fact that you're not in it yet, 
counts against your enrollment. So of those five courses, it's, it's in that group. You can only wait list, however, a maximum of 2.0 FCEs total. Hopefully this isn't gonna happen. You've gotta be pretty unlucky to end up with 2.0 wait lists on your, on your first day of enrollment, but that's the limit if you end up in this case. Wait lists for courses, if we're speaking specifically for fall term and full years, yeah, sorry, go ahead. How do you go through a priority for So that the timetable builder, it has that entry about enrollment controls. You wanna check and see if you have a priority for that course. If it lists no one, no priority control, or sorry, no enrollment controls, then nobody has priority. If it lists a P, you wanna check and see if you have that, the priority for it. It'll list the groups that have it. And so just check and see if you are a student in that group. So you, you'd go to the art history course and you'd look at the, the priority controls and it'll say something to me. It might just say no, in which case you can enroll on it on your course on day. But it might say something to the effect of priority control, yes, with a group for specifically humanities stream students. That would mean that you can log in, but the social science students in this room would have to wait to the general room period to have the course. Apologies for not explaining that clearly before. Okay, so back, back to the wait lists. Um, they close on the 16th of September in the case specifically for courses in fall term and for the full year. Uh, you may notice that courses begin on the 8th of September and so you can be on a wait list after the course begins and get join the course after the class begins. If that happens to you, great. You're gonna have to scramble to catch up. So make sure that you do so. As a general rule, strategically speaking, if you're within 10% of the course capacity in your waitlist rank, and you join the waitlist on the course enrollment date, you've got good odds of getting in. It's not a guarantee, but there's pretty good chances you're gonna get into the course. Outside of that, chances drop off pretty dramatically. You wanna make sure, you know, if you, if you really want a course, but there's only 30 spaces and you're 100th on the waitlist, you're probably wasting your enrollment spot looking after that course. You might wanna look at a backup at that point. You're gonna to wanna to give some thought towards the programs you want, how badly you need that course, and if it's worth risking not getting the course at all against just adding backups. It's a good idea for strategy if it looks like there's one of those really long wait lists, but you really want that course to wait until the 29th during the general enrollment period when you can add that sixth course and then add it then. Any questions? Excellent question. So um, when you are joining a wait list, it implies that the course is completely full, which means that the tutorials and the practicals, which are, are um, scaled to the lecture sections, will also fill. You don't wait list for the tutorial. What happens in the case, uh, in this case, is that you will get a spot into the lecture section and then you're just gonna to have to take whatever tutorial opens up. Whoever, whoever the student is that drops or would have been in that tutorial section, you get their spot. And that's now a conflict for you, well, then you might wanna look at something else, okay? Okay, so uh, talking about the general enrollment period a little bit. So as I mentioned before, 29th is when the general enrollment period begins. This is when, if a course has a priority that you do not have, you can add the course. Um, you can also now enroll up to six courses per term, which again, we don't recommend to actually keep that load, but can be useful for wait lists and planning and strategy. Um, there's no enrollment, just keep in mind, on the 20th of July, so the day before the general enrollment begins, the 2nd of August, which is the day before non-degree students begin, but you don't need to know that, and the 4th of August, which is the day before enrollment begins for UTM and UTSC courses, which again, may not be super relevant to you, but just, if you can't, if for whatever reason, you log into ACORN and can't add courses, check the date and make sure it's not one of these dates. On the 5th of August, you can add those UTM and UTSC courses, which, the slide that I had before mentioned this, uh, hopefully you saw that briefly, but you can tell if the course is UTM or UTSC. These campuses, you do have access to their courses, but they're obviously a little bit further away from, from downtown campus. You'll wanna consider adding those courses carefully. Um, if you are interested in taking UTM or UTSC course, you should have a conversation with us first because you just wanna be aware of what you're doing. 
Last thing is that the last day to enroll in F or Y courses is the 21st of September. So we were talking a little bit before about how you can drop courses in the first couple of weeks and switch them out. That's the date you have until. That's roughly two weeks into classes. So you'll get a good chance to at least sit and lecture, get the syllabus, get a sense of if you like the instructor or not, if the class content's gonna work for you and you can keep making changes until that date. Okay, so this is a really wordy slide, but this is some of the finer advice that I like to give students. So uh, you should only, you can only enroll in one section of a course per term. So a lot of you saw, for example, with EAS 120, there's like 10 different sections. If you wanna change the section that you're in, you have to actually drop the course and add the new section. If this course is a wait list because it's really popular, that means you're now at the back of the wait list. So when you're considering sections, you really want to make sure that you know which section you want, because it's going to be important for your course enrollment date and your strategy for actually getting that course. Let's say we're in a situation where it's the 21st, the 21st of September has just passed. You really, really wanted the Japanese course and you didn't get in, but somebody drops it on the 22nd and you can see on the time table that there's a spot available. Departments will occasionally let students roughly for the week after the deadline's passed. If they can make a good case for themselves, how they're gonna be able to catch up, that they're really, really keen, that they have done all this self-study, will occasionally let you add the course after the deadline. This is something that usually only upper year students should be doing because this is your first time taking courses. You don't know how intense the content's going to be. But again, if this is a course that's really crucial for the program you want, this might be a lifesaver, so keep that in mind. ACORN won't stop you from enrolling in courses that you don't have the prereqs for. It's your job to know that you have the prereqs or not. However, once you add the course, eventually the department that hosts this course will see that you don't have the prereqs and they're just gonna kick you out for that time. So don't add the course unless you have the prereqs. If there's a course that you really, really want and you know that you don't have the prereqs and you manage to get a spot, you can go to the department and say, hey, I know I don't have the prereqs, but here are all the reasons why I'm going to be successful anyway. Departments will sometimes, particularly in the humanities, be open to this, as long as you can make a strong case for yourself. But do you expect to be told no because you're first year students? And again, they're gonna have this idea that you need to be a little bit more prepared for what courses expect. As long as you drop a course by the drop deadline, there's no consequence for having started it. So it's not necessarily a terrible idea to start with six courses. If there's two courses that you just can't decide between, they both sound really, really good. Maybe you wanna take Eco 101 and Eco 105 because you're not sure which one's gonna be a good fit. You can just drop the one that doesn't work after the first week or two, no consequences. Then you're in the five courses you wanted or the four courses you wanted or whatever, and you're happy. At least that you can add that sixth course and then you have it. You don't have to worry about wait lists. You don't have to worry about any of that. Strategically, it's better for you as a student to make sure that you take what you can and give it back later. Okay, so this is not a fun slide, uh, but I gotta say it. Um, you, gotta, you have to understand as new university students, as approximate adults, that you are responsible for your own studies. Our office, the registrar's office, really wants to help you. I personally really, really want to help all of you. But I can only really help you super effectively if you are helping yourselves super effectively. That means that it's your responsibility to read all publicly available information, information emailed to you, particularly from our office, the registrar's office, and the Faculty of Arts and Science, that registrar's office. You need to make sure that you read everything about the courses you want to take, everything about the, the courses you want, the programs that you want, everything about payment and finances. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of expectation. I know, but you're now university students. You are capable of it. You can do it and you should be doing it because it's gonna make my job to help you a lot easier if you know as much as possible about what you're supposed to do. It's your responsibility to know that you have the, the prereqs for courses, cohorts for courses. It's your responsibility to know that you have exclusions the university is just gonna slap you with an extra and tell you that your course doesn't count for credit. It's gonna assume that you knew the course was an exclusion. And so if you suddenly are not getting credit for a course and you are like, oh my God, registrar, what do I do? 
We're going to tell you, you should have read the calendar. And you need to know that you're in conflicts and that you shouldn't be in them. And we're not going to, we, we can't detect those for you. And we can't reach out to you and tell you you shouldn't do that. It's your responsibility to know that's happening. It's your responsibility to know dates, deadlines, and course enrollment rules. There's a bunch of really useful date uh, resources on the Faculty of Arts and Science website. I put some links in the, in the slides. I can provide them to you later as well. You need to know the deadlines for dropping courses. You need to know the deadlines for LWD and credit on credit courses, which again, somebody mentioned they didn't talk about credit on credit, so I'm going to talk about that in a second. It's also finally your responsibility to know when you need help and to ask them for it. I absolutely want to help you. I may not realize I need it. So you got to come and ask, and I will absolutely help you. Okay, so last section. Um, this one's going to be pretty quick. I actually haven't been keeping time. How are we doing? We're doing well. We're doing well. Okay, okay. So we're going to talk about registration a little bit. Um, this is the specifics of what actually registering means. We're going to talk about money a little bit, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. Okay, so first of all, your fees, your invoice, where all of the stuff that you owe lives is on a form. It's under financial information. You're not going to see anything in there yet. It will say it will say zero or you're not registered or something along those lines. Those fees aren't going to show up until the middle of July. So eventually, just before your course enrollment, which again is on what's the day? 21st of July, exactly. So a little bit before the 21st of July there's suddenly going to be thousands of dollars on your invoice. That's normal. You either have to pay your minimum payment, which if you look at your invoice and you scroll to the bottom of the invoice, it'll say in all caps, minimum payment to register, and it will tell you what that amount is. That amount just by the way is your fall fees, um, but it can vary a little bit for various reasons, but just so you know, that's what it is. You either have to pay that fee, or you have to defer your fees through one of the options that are available to defer your fees, which include OSAP, student loans, scholarships, a couple of different things. Please talk to me if you think you can qualify for a deferral. You have to do one of those two things by the 31st of August. So for now, what it's going to say on ACORN, and you'll all be able to see this, is that it says you're invited to the 2022-2023 session. It'll say your admission stream. If you don't pay or defer your fees by the 31st of August, you're going to get kicked out of your courses, and it's going to say you're now financially canceled. Particularly, uh, and not to intimidate you because this is going to be a problem because you know the 31st of August is your deadline, but as first year students who have not earned credit at the university yet, if you're financially canceled and you're removed from courses, we cannot re-register you. You have to reapply next year as a new student because you have not yet become a student at the University of Toronto yet. So do not miss the deadline. Make sure that you pay or defer. Once you do pay or defer, your status will move from invited to registered. Once you're registered, there's no risk you're going to get kicked out of your courses. There are uh, financial consequences for not meeting payment deadlines, but you won't be removed from your courses. OK, um, as first year students, uh, and all students with a couple of exceptions, you will always by default be paying the program fee initially. The program fee is a flat rate that all students pay uh, initially, as I mentioned, for everybody. If you are taking 4.0 FCEs or more, you are on the program fee. There are a couple of, there might be some students that are interested in transferring to Rotten Commerce. There's a couple of programs that behave a little bit differently, but in your cases, as humanities social science admits, this is how this plays out for you. If you're in four credits or more, it's the same fee. That does mean, for example, that if you're in five courses or 5.0 FCEs and you drop a course, you're still in 4.5 FCEs, you're still on the program fee, there's no expectation for refund, you're not going to be getting anything along those lines. If you do intend to take less than this, so 3.5 FCEs or less, you qualify for something called the course fee structure, which means that you're paying on by course for courses. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad idea, particularly if you have advanced credits uh, and you are already on track to earn those four credits you need for program. But if you've been paying attention, you've probably noticed that you do need four credits to advance the second year. And so taking three and a half credits means that you will remain in first year. So it's not necessarily the best plan. 
It's certainly, it can be a good idea, particularly if you have financial concerns, you should absolutely have a conversation with our office if this is what's going on. If you do plan to register with accessibility services, which you may or may not know about at this point, if you think that this might apply to you, if you have accommodation needs for your courses, please come talk to me if you have to have a conversation with you. One of the accommodations that you can get through accessibility services puts you on a special course fee structure uh, that can have more than 3.5 estimates. But again, that, that'll only really apply if you intend to register for this. So do just have a conversation. Okay, so if you are getting a scholarship, you can defer your fees with it, but the key thing that you need to know is that the value of that scholarship needs to equal at least your minimum payment. If it does not reach that amount, so let's say if you got one of the very fabulous, generous NS, um, tuition or NS scholarships, but it doesn't actually reach that minimum payment, you can't use it to defer your fees. But if you got, say, if you got the University of Toronto Scholar, congrats to you. If you're a domestic student, that covers almost all of your fees, and that would qualify to defer your fees. Come and talk to me about the process for that. I can give you the paperwork. If you can pay your minimum payments or you're getting student loans or whatever the case is, and something is going wrong, OSAP, either there's a hang up with your OSAP or there's an issue with your financing or whatever, and you know that the 31st of August is coming, you know you can pay these things, you're gonna get them soon, but there's an issue, come and have a conversation with us. Because like I said, if you financially cancel, you're in hot water. So there, we have some instruments to help you. And like I mentioned before, you need to know that this is a problem and you need to know the deadlines. By coming out of a conversation with us, we can find a way to help. Lastly, make sure that you know when the rest of your fees are due. These deadlines vary depending on how you deferred your fees, if you deferred your fees, this kind of stuff. This information is available online. I'm happy to share it with you. I'm not going to give you specific dates because there's a bunch of them. But make sure you know what, when that, the rest of your money is due and make sure that you pay it. Okay, that's it. Um, so that's, that is all that I have for slides. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Something that I do want to jump right on, because I know that I mentioned credit and credit and late withdrawal. And so I do want to make a quick mention of what these are. Uh, just before we go into questions, and then we can basically have questions until people are done. After that, uh, you are expected to go back to NS. So that big, nice green space that was outside the town hall, that's where lunch is going to be. So just mosey on back there for 1230. Okay, so CR and CR. This is credit, no credit. This means that you are taking a course, you're designating it as a pass-fail course. As long as you pass the course, you're usually getting 50% or more, you get CR for the course credit and you move on. This is great to use for courses where you think you're really interested in the content, but you're worried you're going to be successful. Let's say, for example, that you're interested in computer science and you manage to snap up a spot in CSC 148, but you're terrified you're going to fail it. You can credit no credit that course. This way you can still take it. You can still get a 51. You can still get a credit. Because it's CR, that grade is hidden. So on your transcript, it's just going to say CR. And that grade also does not have any impact on your CGPA. So you can be an A student getting all 80s and 90s with that 151, but it's behind credit no credit, so it's fine. The caveat with credit no credit courses is that you cannot use them for courses that are for your program requirements. So if the course that you're taking is needed for the programs you want to enroll in, you can't credit no credit the course. It, it's just not allowed. You have a limit of 2.0 FCEs total that you're allowed to credit no credit in your academic career. And that includes courses that you NCR or fail. LWD is late withdrawal. So there's a drop deadline for courses, again, available online, easy to find, happy to tell you what that date is, don't worry about it for now. Even after that date, if something goes terribly wrong with the last midterm or whatever the case is in your course, and you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna fail this course, I'm gonna get a terrible grade, you can come speak to our office and do something called a late withdrawal. It's a late drop. It's similar to a drop, except the main difference is that when you drop a course, it vanishes from your transcript. When you LWD a course, the course remains in the transcript and the grade is recorded as LWD. Aside from that, the course is gone. So it's, it doesn't count. It, it, the, 
There's no grade behind it. It doesn't affect your CGPA. It's still basically a drop and it's definitely better than a fail, but it is worth mentioning and noting that it stays in the transcript. And so you want ideally to drop courses by the drop deadline. You can only LWD 3.0 FCEs worth of courses in your academic career. So you may end up using these, you may not. It's a useful tool for you to know about. What's the deadline? The deadline for, yeah, so the deadline to LWD courses, Donald's quizzing me here, that the deadline to LWD courses is always the last day of class. So there is classes run till whatever the end of the session is, depending on the FRS, and then there's roughly a month or three weeks of exam period. The last day of the LWD courses is the last day before the exam period. So it's way more generous than the drop deadline, which is usually about halfway through the term. Does it say the credit? Credit no credit deadline is earlier than the LWD deadline. Usually it will be going forward. The credit no credit deadline is the same as the drop deadline in most cases and it should be this year. I think it is. I haven't looked at the calendar recently. Okay, so um, are there any questions? On the chat. Okay, let's hear them. Um, the first question is Can you take both a first year one seminar and a ones program? Okay, so the question is, can you take a first year foundations one seminar and a one program? The answer to that question is yes, but we uh, advise that you take no more than 0.5 to 1.0 FCEs of FYF seminars. One's programs, and uh, you'll, you'll have to refer to the one site, have two different structures. Some one's programs uh, have an application process and have several courses that you have to take as part of that process. And some of them are pretty open. For example, the NS1's program is open. There's no application. You can just add the courses. You can treat those that one's program as part of your FYF seminar enrollment. Something like the Monk one is a lot more structured. It's 2.0 FCEs. You have to apply. It's probably not a great idea to be taking FYF seminars in combination with the Monk one, particularly if you're trying to meet your program requirements. Next question. Um, how do you get to know where on campus your course is based around? Excellent question. So that map that I showed earlier, there's a, it's surprisingly difficult to find given how awesome it is. Um, there's a link in the, in the slides, which again, we'll make available to you. That map shows all the building codes. So a really popular one is Sid Smith SS, which is smack dab in the middle of campus. It's the hub of the Faculty of Arts and Science. When you look at the timetable, the location, it will list the room number for a course. The room number for a course includes the building code. So a, pot, like a lot of courses will be in SS like 1105. This tells you that the course is at Sid Smith. So uh, per what we were talking about before, when you're looking at the timetable builder and you're structuring your courses, you want to also pay attention to the location of your course. A lot of courses, uh, as we were seeing before, are some of them are synchronous or online, so you don't need to worry about the location. Some of them will say TBA or TBD because they're not scheduled yet. So you'll need to keep checking back to make sure you know these things are scheduled. What's up? Um, then there was another question. How do you log into Acorn or make an account? Okay, great. Um, if you haven't logged into Acorn yet, you should. You use So you log into Acorn using your join ID. At this point, you should have your join ID as, as an admin to the University of Toronto, and you should have a password. You'll use the same credentials to access Acorn. You will ultimately be getting your T card, so the physical student card that you need uh, for various reasons on campus, typically to access the gym, dining hall, that kind of stuff. As you go through the process for activating or for getting your T card, you will convert your join ID into a UTOR ID which will ultimately give you access to your mail.etoronto email address and a couple of other online services here at the university. That's all. What else is there? Um, if someone had a scholarship, would it be automatically subtracted from the total amount that they owe not? Excellent question. So uh, scholarships, um, they there are a couple of different kinds of scholarships. I'll address uh, most specifically the ones that are coming from the university directly. So if you've got an NS entrance scholarship, you've got the U of T scholar, if you've got the international U of T scholar, whatever the case is, those scholarships will automatically go against your fees. However, 
they will not automatically go in against your fees until sometime in as late as October or so. This is part of the reason why you need to defer your fees when you have a scholarship, because that what that does, we, we verify that you got the scholarship, we at our office register you so you're no longer at risk of getting removed from your courses and your fees sit there unpaid, but then your scholarship rolls in, pays whatever it pays, and if there's a remaining balance, it's on you to pay the rest. You have until April to do that though, in the case that you have a scholarship deferral, so you've got lots of time. Someone asked if they have five transfer credits already, do they get to enroll as a second year student um, on the 21st of July? Excellent question. So uh, it's possible that you have enough transfer credits, whether through advanced standing or you're coming from another institution, uh, that you are a second year student, so you have four credits or more. If you do have four credits or more, you are a bit of a unique case. You are a second year student. Your course enrollment date would be the second year course enrollment date. And though normally you are expected to have enrolled in a program, when you are in this case, you're considered a transfer student. You'll see that you're on some of your program information that there's a big T on your program code that means transfer. You're able to enroll in courses and in many ways behave well. For the purposes of programs, you can enroll in courses as if you're a first year student. With the, actually that's, that's maybe a little misleading. You can't, you don't have a priority as a first year student because you are technically a second year student. However, you don't need programs. So you can complete courses, the first year courses that you need as for a program as a transfer student second year. And then you would enroll in your programs at the end of your first year, year your first year here at U of T where you would technically be a second year. I hope that makes sense for the person that asked that. This is a bit of a confusing issue for a couple of reasons. And it's possible in some cases that students that are transferring can get access to programs. It's always a good idea to come talk to us if you're in that case. There's a question about the uh, clarification around the priority status enrollment time versus the general. Right, okay, yeah. So I, I feel like I've maybe botched that explanation a little bit. So 21st of July. Is your, that's the beginning of your course enrollment. Assuming that you meet the priority controls for a course that you want, you meet all of the enrollment controls for a course that you want, you can enroll in that course. The mo one of the most, in fact, the most common enrollment indicator is P for priority. If a course has a priority enrollment indicator, it will have a group of students listed within that priority that have that priority. If that's you, great, enroll in the 21st. If it's not you, you will still ultimately get a chance to add the course, assuming that you have the prerequisites, but you have to wait until the 29th of July, so the general enrollment period to add these courses. It just means that the students with priority get roughly a week before you do to add the course. It doesn't necessarily mean you can't get into the course, but it will potentially affect how many lecture sections there are, for example. Yeah, could I just add a few comments about that? You certainly can. Um, if you're looking at the timetable or online anywhere, you're going to see that first year students are the last to get into the system. The fourth year are in, then the second, third, then the second, then the first. And you might think, Jesus, I'm the last one in. What if I don't get the courses I want? The university does a fair bit of planning to figure out how many students are going to be enrolled in these courses in all years, including first year. And that's why this P comes up so often, because Everybody else above you in year gets to choose their courses, but they often can't choose the first year courses because yes. the priority is for first year students. Yes. Sometimes the priority is more specific, like first year students in the science division. I mentioned the science division in the humanities room because this is the case that there will be so many students who want to get the biology and the chemistry that the university knows how many students want that. We know how many students are coming in this year, but we know that there's those rooms will be full. We have enough spaces in Convocation Hall for approaching 1,500 students to take those courses. If there's a couple spaces left, so the priority falls away on the 29th of July, a humanities and social science students who's interested in sciences and an upper year student from any other year can try and get those last couple of spaces. That's a mini So there's a lot that goes into planning, but every year, like we don't know exactly how many people accept, we know how many people accept that they're offered. There's a lot of people have come this year. There might be a couple more people who've come than we even planned for. 
So this is why Jack mentioned the 30, the 21st of July is so important. And why I would emphasize again the time. Yes. If you are starting at 10, um, you want to try and get in at 10. At to Jack's point, don't freak out if get the circle of death and just try again. But um, don't leave it a couple of days to do. You want to do it on the day and ideally catch your time. And you can find out what your time is a week before. Why I'm yelling at the room? Could I just say, I'm not sure if the person who has a question about hours is in this room, but I just, do you mind opening up the timetable over sure. again? Well, I just say that in the calendar, did you show this in the morning? Beside the course, it says some number that is a multiple of 12. So it will say 24L, 12T, or it will say 72L. There's 12 weeks in a term. Um, so if you're focused in a term and you're going to have three hours of lectures, you're going to be in lectures 36 hours in that term, and it's going to say 36L. There might be two lectures a week and a tutorial, and so it'll say 24L and 12T. Uh, you don't really need to know all this information because when Jack opens up a time to time data builder, you'll see that you're going to choose a section of a course that actually has those three hours plus the, the, the number of lectures plus it. But you'll also see that there's like you'll see the lecture that you choose and you'll choose a tutorial. The lecture is what gets you enrollment in the course. Jack mentioned the tutorial, and you might be lucky enough to just get into a lecture and get popped into a tutorial. But you can do a tutorial. You can't do lectures in that. So the lecture is the most important thing. Yes. And when you're prioritizing them in your enrollment card, really, you're in. So you just hit all five right away and get yourself in as quickly as possible. But you can fiddle with your tutorial. But don't fiddle with your lectures to Jack's point. Don't accidentally take yourself out of one because you think you want to switch into another one. So it has a wait list and oops. Because now an hour has passed and someone else has filled up the form. Does that make sense? Or have I just scared everyone? A little bit of both, probably. Okay. Um, no, no, no problem. Any remaining questions for the room? Okay, so, oh. Great. So the question is, if you came to say sort of like a financial plan, payment plans, that sort of thing. Um, so the minimum payment deadline is hard and fast. And so as you probably identified, like it's half the fees, it's pretty significant. Um, once you have made that minimum payment or you've deferred your fees, the rate at which you pay the fees doesn't really matter until you reach the deadline for the remaining fees that you have. If it's going to be a problem that, uh, that you need to pay all of the minimum payment at the same time, or you can pay the minimum payment, but you're going to have difficult time with your remaining fees, that's a great time to schedule an appointment with our financial advisor, Daniela. We can go over your options at that point. To sort of try to give you a clear answer, a payment plan is kind of a possibility, but it requires a little bit of a conversation. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. I think there's one last question about um, how to transfer credits from AP courses in high school. Okay, great. So uh, if you do, if you did take advanced standing, so whether it's advanced placement, IB, there's a couple of other options. Uh, you can look at um, what advanced standing credits look like on the Bible Course of Science. But the simple answer that we can get into more detail in cases, please email registrar.ns. But uh, your board, the, the place that does the testing for your advanced standing, will have an option to send your test scores. And to be clear, you need to take the tests for these, uh, for these credits. They'll have an option to send your test scores to the university. You need to tell them to do that. Once those scores are sent, the office of the Faculty of Arts and Science that handles, that handles transfer credits will assess your scores and they will issue you transfer credits based on those scores. There is a really handy chart on the Faculty of Arts and Science website that I can give you the link to that tells you, based on what curriculum you were taking and what score you got, what transfer credits you can expect. Um, advanced standing transfer credits can be a little bit tricky uh, because you might, for example, take a advanced standing math course that you think corresponds to first year calculus, 
when in fact it doesn't exactly, and it doesn't exactly behave the way that you want it to for programs. Um, so have a conversation with our office about your advanced and interest rates. Anything else? Okay, so I, uh, I, you're good to go. Uh, please feel free to leave. Uh, if you want to send me an email, you, I'll put the, the uh, email back on the screen. If you do have any questions, I'm just going to stand here awkwardly for the next few minutes, and you can come and have a chat with me. And then uh, just make sure you make it back to the end of screen shortly because we're having lunch.